There are a ton of reasons this movie works and is amazing, but this background track setting up the film with the first thing you hear is a big one. Instead of going with a strictly animated superhero tone, the movie is a new mix of superheroes and 60s Bond and is in fact set in 1963. Also, it's completely different from the usual Pixar logo music. Sometimes I just want it to stay saved, you know? Interesting behind the scenes look at superheroing. Also, just in general, this universe where superheroes are like plumbers, another necessary if not glamorous cog in our society. No offense to plumbers, you guys are the real heroes. But rather than a big setup how awesome they are action montage or cold open battle, it's just real people being interviewed. I just cleaned up this mess, can we keep it clean for, for 10 minutes? Trying to leave on a high note, a la George Costanza. That's just, that's just a really good logo. Got the E and the G mixed together in there. Yeah, some good branding. And then a blending of a cliche superhero theme overpowered by Giacchino's Bond style theme. Brad Bird, this color grading and hazy tone used for the prologue scene. You can almost feel the heat in the air. Two birds, one tree. Also, thank goodness for cartoon physics because that dude would be dead. Reflection of the street lamp in the tire hubcap. It's not an eye, but it'll do. Time of day continuity with the sun shining in and creating stark shadow contrast to the insanely rich sunset giving Wakanda a run for its money. I mean, look at those colors. Are you doing anything later? I have a previous engagement. Ha, <laughs> a literal one. You know, because they're engaged to be married. I'm your number one fan! Sensitivity. <laughs> That's an interesting quandary that they just sort of glaze over. Well, I finally figured out who I am. I am your ward. Two things, Buddy's reflection being bigger, foreshadowing his importance later on, and the fact that my man Jason Lee voices his younger self. Monsieur incroyable! And incredible! I'd say this is persistence. One of the ways this film sticks to realism is showing the limits of their powers when it makes sense. Like Mr. Incredible wincing before the train impact. Just because he can stop it doesn't mean it won't hurt. Brad Bird actually said it was something he planned on putting in right from the beginning as a way to humanize the heroes. Ha, <laughs> these are all the cape users. Dead, dead cape users. And the injury received from Mr. Incredible's actions, so-called, causes him daily pain. Hey, I saved your life! You didn't save my life, you ruined my death! Another realistic repercussion of taking the law into your own hands. But then on the other side, an increase in crime is hinted at in the newspaper. Just a high angle shot like this does so much to show the pain and monotony of Bob's existence next to a support structure with a high voltage line on it, visually exaggerating how much he doesn't fit in. Now I see why this was set in the 60s. Put this film in modern day and Mr. Griffin could have used a high frame rate camera and Dash's gig is up. Jack Jack's facing forward. So realistic period detail, but man, the 60s were a terrifying time. Everyone special, Dash. Which is another way of saying no one is. Egalitarianism burn. More quality visual storytelling. Maybe my wife's just wicked smart, but she had never seen this movie until now and she immediately knew what Violet's power would be. That's because Brad Bird makes it clear with Violet's hunched posture and the hair in front of her face that she enjoys being hidden. Let's talk about Brad Bird's usage of depth of field in a movie where you can have everything in focus if you want at any and all times. Having certain things out of focus helps pull your attention to different subjects on screen the way you would in a live action film. Huh? You're making weird faces again. No. Realism. Put you on tape and you still got away with it? Whoa. You must have been booking. How fast do you think you were going? Ah. Encouragement? Oh, I love the display of all their powers. Even superpowered families struggle with the same stuff we do. Appropriately frizzy hair. Oh, if you watch Jack-Jack in the background, he follows along with the conversation. What does Baron Von Ruthless do? <laughs> he starts monologuing. He starts <laughs> monologuing. I mean, a guy has me on a platter and he won't shut up. Superhero movie making fun of a supervillain trope. Ugh, just this slow pan towards the police scanner before it's the focus while Frozone is telling his story. Gonna gush about the score again. It just transports you back to Lazenby and Connery Bond. And a lot of it was recorded on analog tapes to give the horns that distinct sound. And Bird actually talks about his vocal length in this scene. It's as if the camera is concerned with Frozone, but just like the cop doesn't realize what's actually happening. And just in case you thought these heroes murder police officers, his eyes are moving, he'll be fine. Probably. <laughs> Mr. Incredible is humming his own theme. What an awesome physical representation of how even though Bob is huge, he and his wife are equals in more ways than one. Spot on depiction of how important the boss thinks he is having four clocks for different time zones even though they're all the same. Or maybe he's just obsessed with that whole clock metaphor of his. 
So this is a memo telling InsuraCare employees that phone calls, electricity consumption, and even pencils will be deducted from their pay while at the same time thanking the employees for making it the most profitable year ever. So if anyone deserves to be thrown through a wall, he got away. Yeah, but the joke's on him with those leopard print pants. There are some fun details in this room. Bob doodles his own logo, he has a jar of bullets that bounced off his chest, and just a bunch of fun news clippings and fan art on the walls. Also, so appropriate that an artist's rendering of Mr. Incredible would look nothing like Bob since people somehow see someone completely different. This message will self-destruct. Uh -uh. So I think JJ ripped this scene off almost entirely for Mission Impossible 3, just swapping out the tablet for a disposable camera. So that's, that's gotta count for something. Also, Bird riffs on the self-destructing message in his Mission Impossible movie. So, yeah. Unfortunately. Let me guess. It got smart enough to wonder why it had to take orders. We Clearly not the first time Bob's dealt with a self-aware human murdering machine. Or, you know, possessed houses that kidnap your daughter. Something so simple like this over-the-robot shoulder camera angle is an example of one of the many things that elevates this film above others of its kind. Wouldn't be a 60s throwback movie with a little lava inside a volcano. <laughs> Chiropractic generosity. <laughs> That's actually really brutal when you realize he just tricked it into pulling its own brains out. I hope our future AI overlords will know that it seems like this were all in good fun. Scratch that, now it's a 60s throwback movie. Formal dining room next to a retractable lava waterfall wall. He's attracted to power, so am I. And a reasonable reason for living there. You know, besides the opportunities for ridiculously beautiful shot compositions. A moving up in the world, spending more quality time with your family, getting in shape, in some more visually stunning locations, I might add. And a PG rekindling the spark with your wife montage is the fastest way to, well, rekindle that spark with your wife. I used to design for gods. Making her wall carving is all the more relevant. Push too hard, darling, but I accept. You know, I was gonna say something about how funny Edna is with her slightly Asian, slightly German accent and praise the excellent voice work by her voice actor, and lo and behold, she's voiced by Brad Bird. Probably common knowledge, but it blew my mind. April 23rd, 57, Cape caught in a jet turbine. Cape Death Shadow. 78 degrees in no mana set. You know what they say, no man is an island, unless you're Paul Simon, I guess. Even the futuristic tech has a mid-century's vision of the future feel to it. D-Wing, room A-113. What room now? How could he possibly remember such an uniconic number? Ugh, look at the shadows of the leaves outside through the window. Such beauty created rather than captured. Love the subtle sounds of the robot moving around outside. I went through quite a few supers to get it worthy to fight you, but man, it wasn't good enough! Jason Lee kills this role. He's the unsung hero of this film since he's so unlikable, but he crushes every bit of his performance. Fly dog! You got me monologuing! I... Not only recognizing the trope this time, but also defeating it. Edna mode. <laughs> and guess. That's actually a brilliant security system. Someone could force you to enter your passwords, but still end up dead if you want them to. It also withstand the temperature of over 1,000 degrees. Convenient. Another beautiful shot with the car blocking out the moon as it approaches. Talk about arrogance. Syndrome sees himself as the father of all Greek gods. Yeah, yeah, that, that checks out. I like to think Psychwave would have done a little better. A 1.6? It's kind of interesting, though. It looks like he started with the telekinesis supers first. Not even Harley Quinn destroyed one droid? But man, this is like the Order 66 of this film. Pretty dark to have all these supers dead. Is that a dolly zoom in an animated film I see? Another smart security system that allows you to question the infiltrator later. They're just all getting coffee at the same time. Yeah. Optimism with a touch of realism. So you do know these people? Yeah, if your wife was Holly Hunter, literally the most recognizable voice in all of Hollywood after, like, Morgan Freeman, Sam Elliott, or James Earl Jones, she'd just have to sigh or cough and you'd know it was her. You don't have to worry about one single thing, Mrs. Farr. I've got this babysitting thing wired. Just like my teeth. I can totally handle anything this baby can dish out. They actually made a short film to disprove exactly that. India Golf 9 or 9 are transmitting in the blind guard. Disengage, repeat, disengage! I love how quickly it turns from concern over who's watching the baby, something Helen cares deeply about, to Elastigirl realizing we're all gonna die. And having to become something she thought she'd put behind her. 
She goes from mommy to all business in a split second. Vi, you have to put a force field around the plane! And it's a genuinely terrifying scene. Not because you think three of the five mains might die, but because Elastigirl turning on business mode and speaking pilotese in a way most of us don't understand but recognize as such means that for a split second she has to choose trying to save their lives over protecting her daughter's psyche and feelings. In a weird way, Helen's total control of the situation rather than emotional outburst adds to the terror and grounds the scene. Her command of the situation just gets to me. Abort! 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 And the sincere horror in her voice is palpable. Also a bit of an expectation subversion. You probably expected Violet to make the force field at the last second, but not this time. Also, if you're questioning why she was able to protect them, remember this? Virtually indestructible. And then we're quickly reminded that these are just two kids who think they're falling to their deaths. They won't exercise restraint because your children, they will kill you if they get the chance. And that's an intense but obviously necessary message for the kids. Something no parent would ever want to tell them. The instinct would be to protect them from reality, but she knows she has to actually protect them from death by preparing them. The sound design and composition of this film continues to impress me. Everything is so precise as she's sneaking into the hideout. Just in general, I love the skulking around with Elastigirl. She gets to show off her moves and use her unique abilities in inventive ways. Huh, you would need a lot of power to restrain old Bobby Boy. Why are you here? How can you possibly bring me lower? What more can you take away from me? He has every right to be suspicious since their whole premise was their deception and needing to help him with something out of their control. Hugging. I also like that while the Bob was cheating on me all along cliche is thrown in there real quick, there was never any confusion about what Bob wanted or whether he'd actually have an affair. He's only hugging her because his wife and kids are alive. So it's the chase through the forest on Endor with those blade drone things from Wild Wild West and Largest Fit of Human. I'm just kidding, getting to see Dash finally stretch his legs as it were while being chased by a gyroscopic one-man killing machine is all fantastic. <laughs> Good stuff. I love the look on Dash's face. He's just a kid, he's never been in a fight, it never occurred to him he could dodge punches with these. <laughs> yes, that's exactly how a kid would react to learning he could run on water. That giggle alone is worth a couple wins. Again, feel like a broken record, but the score, the way this sequence is shot, it's all so impressive and entertaining. We always get a strong feeling about how fast everything is moving. Yep. You keep trying to pick a fight, but I'm still just happy you're alive. Perspective. There you are. Hey! Saving your sister. <gasps> Saving your brother. <laughs> also, yep. Love you. We've all experienced that moment when you realize as a kid that your parents are more than just your parents when you get to see them do things from their previous life. I mean, for me, it was finding out that they liked music I discovered in middle school. This, th their parents are badass superheroes. <laughs> Teamwork. Also a bunch of yups. My fault. I've been a lousy father. Blind what I have. Apology win with Bob relating his character arc about as sincerely as anyone could. <laughs> you know what they say, if the RV's a knockin', don't expect Mr. Incredible to have left anyone alive. Where's my super suit? What? Where is my super suit? Cool headedness. We are talking about the greater good. Greater good? I am your wife. I'm the greatest good you are ever gonna get. Honesty. Is that Byronic? Byronic? No, Byronic has a different outfit. <laughs> Debating which hero it is, just like, <gasps> did this movie predict the MCU? Syndrome has some pretty cool tech, he's just terrible at using it. He's constantly doing dumb things, making mistakes and putting people in danger. I mean, he created a learning robot and didn't have a contingency for losing his wristband controller. Although I guess it's not like Mr. Incredible is super careful with innocent life. Ingenuity? Cre creepy ingenuity? How you doing, honey? Do I have the answer? And another human moment for a hero. Of course she can do it, doesn't mean it's not super painful. No! That's what this is? Some sort of workout? I can't lose you again! Sincerity. Like, real sincerity. That's not an cut with a joke, it's some weighty stuff. <laughs> Saving your little bro again! Do it! Do it! Do it! Quality time with your son callback. <laughs> Resourcefulness. That's old school. Yeah? <laughs> no school like the old school. 
Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston, two famous Disney animators. Man, one more quick, beautiful sunset. <laughs> well, duh. Still awesome. Bob, throw me! More unique teamwork. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Still not like those Saturday morning cartoon bad guys. Really, really not like them. That was totally wicked! And even the something amazing, I guess, kid got his payoff. Hey, you're wearing your hair back. Huh? Oh, yeah. I, I just, yeah. It looks good. Thanks, Dad. Just like Bob points out, Violet starts with her hair in front of her face, and as she gains more confidence, and also, very importantly, as her mother shows faith in her, she starts pushing her hair out of her face. Her personality is reflective of it as well as she comes out of her shell. I'll concede that going on a family adventure and perfecting your superpower doesn't necessarily mean your social anxiety will be cured, but death-defying situations could put things into perspective. And we can all learn to fake it. Look at me, you guys probably think other humans don't terrify me. <laughs> don't give up! Make it Behold the Underminer! Behold the Ratzenberger! Also, looks like they're picking right up where this one left off in the next one. So, creating a good enough setup worth paying off. Yep. And another reimagining of events in this film with 2D animation. One of my favorite things about The Incredibles is that it's a special type of origin story. We're introduced to the world not through a typical this is how they get their powers cliche, but through events in the story unfolding. They already have their powers, but they're not superheroes yet or anymore. That's the real origin story in this film, the family superhero team. Which is new compared to the Fantastic Four all you want. The Incredibles are an actual family which presents lots of interesting dynamics. But really the most unique part of this film is the first thing you notice when the film starts. The blend of spies and heroes, supervillains and their layers. There's action, but also sneaky espionage stuff. But the best thing this film has going for it is something Brad Bird calls the mundane and the fantastic. Everyone is super powered, but they still have arguments at the dinner table. They just look a little different. You can be sent a self-destructing message because you're a super secret sneaker, but that doesn't mean you're not gonna have to dry everything off with your pink hair dryer after the sprinklers go off. The big ending battle is epic and tense, but it actually comes down to who has the remote. And it's something that makes not totally original superheroes. I mean, each has their official version, but the characterizations and the struggles these real people go through are what make it work. I made a statement in in last week's Black Panther video about being able to relate to Iron Man or Thor or Black Panther. And while my point was that skin color, status, or even species shouldn't matter when relating to characters, that's something that The Incredibles nails. They're just a regular family. The parents have these past lives that they've had to keep hidden in order to protect their children. That's relatable. And the kids are growing into who they're supposed to be and learning new things about themselves. Even when they're trying to save the world or escape the villain's evil clutches, we're still connecting to the family struggle between a brother and sister or a mother's concern with her appearance after having three kids or how difficult marriage can be when you're unhappy with your job. A large part of this movie is Bob's arc to let go of the past and focus on the now with his family. Although, if Elastigirl is concerned with her butt being too big, can't she just redistribute some of that? It, it doesn't matter. She's the more mature adult and the one that understands the value and importance of her family right from the beginning. But a midlife crisis is also relatable. The biggest complaint anyone could lob at this film is that you need to be born with abilities rather than develop or invent them. And yes, that's total crap, obviously. Batman and Iron Man exist. Or, well, you know what I mean. But that's not what separates Syndrome from The Incredibles. He wants to be a hero, not do hero work. Just like a movie! And just when all hope is lost, Syndrome will save the day! Mr. Incredible and Elastigirl joke about who gets the credit for the collar in the beginning, but their drive is not notoriety. It's helping people. At the very worst, Bob wants to relive his glory days, but it's never to serve his ego. Syndrome literally puts people in danger so that he can look like the hero. Edna is the perfect example of someone who perfected a talent and worked hard rather than just being born with a gift. The message of be who you were meant to be is more my takeaway. Mr. Incredible failed at being an insurance claims adjuster. He was meant to be a hero. I brought it up a few times, but Michael Giacchino deserves a bunch of credit for his score in this film. He never disappoints, but he made something special in this film. As you know, I tend to hum the theme from whatever movie I'm working on all week while I'm making these videos, and just yesterday I noticed that Julia was humming the James Bond theme, which means either I switched over, which is possible, or it's so similar in tone that that's what got stuck in her head. So, good on you, Chikino. This movie is filled with so many beautiful shots and fun ways of framing scenes. This scene, for instance. Traveling with Mr. Incredible, hearing the silence cut by the wind whipping. So much character in simple shots like these. Plenty of Easter eggs and references to other movies like the Luxo Deli and Mr. Incredible Pez Dispenser, two A113s, a car from Cars. I mean, the whole thing is a love letter to first the golden age of comics and then the silver age, and then obviously retro spy flicks. 
The detail is off the charts again in this film, to the point where when Bob is walking through the jungle, you just think, yeah, Bob's just walking through the jungle. And then you realize every leaf was deliberately built and placed, every dead stump reaching branch, it was all created. For 2004, the hair and fabric movements are insanely impressive. The waterfalls and lava, everything in this film is gorgeous. And even beyond that, some of the animated locations are just the most beautiful places ever shown in a movie. This entire sequence from the plane going underwater then transitioning to the tunnel. It's all amazing, and I can't believe we finally got a sequel. I'm excited for that, and here's to 10 more. And if you're in the mood for more Incredibles, which obviously you are, you should go check out my buddies at Wisecrack. They're currently working on their quick take for The Incredibles 2, where they talk about themes and analyze some interesting aspect of the film that never ceases to amaze me. So I'm looking forward to that. The link will be in the description when it's live. And while you're waiting, check out their Earthling Cinema on The Incredibles. They have a totally different take on what the hidden meaning in The Incredibles is, and since it's from an alien's perspective, you know it's got some credibility. Earthling Cinema takes a deep look at stuff going on under the surface using philosophy and intelligent research to make some inspired conclusions. And they've covered a bunch of movies, animation included. But Wisecrack has something for everyone. They love to look deeper into video games, TV shows, current and past movies, even something you know that I'm fond of, talking about what went wrong with movies that may have missed the mark. So check them out, subscribe to hear about all their new amazing content coming out. Next week, another highly requested movie, actually possibly the first film ever requested. A movie from this series was almost my first video ever, but back then I was only planning on doing the worst of the franchises, not expecting you guys to like videos for good movies too. So until next week, stay incredible. Is that, do, do I have a catchphrase? Those guys that tried to kill us! That was the best vacation ever! We're too excited to sleep.